have with us um, some, somebody who I believe will touch our souls and allow us to um, connect to issues in different ways, through spoken word, through art, um, as well as through the activism. And so it's a great honor to introduce Bobby Lefebvre, who is a spoken word artist and activist. And um, his bio is in your book, but let me just say that he once ranked as the 10th best slam poet in the world. In the world? You're supposed to say, oh my gosh, oh come my on, God. in the world. Whoa. Yeah, exactly. And I know it's 5.30, but really this is big stuff. Um, and uh, one of the things I found really interesting about his bio is that that has also been grounded in real work on the ground. Um, he has specialized in working with youth uh, who are on probation. And with that, please let's give a very warm welcome to Bobby Lefebvre. How is everybody? Good, good. I'm super excited to be here for you guys this evening. Um, so over the last uh, eight months, I've actually had a reassignment in position, and I've actually been working with unaccompanied refugee minors from all over the world. Um, so really, my, the, the swing of my job now is, is really working with these youth from all over the world uh, and assisting them in acclimation and integration into our society. So it's been a, a really, really uh, neat jump for me to work with these kids, and I've learned so much more from them than I'm sure that they're learning from me. Um, but it's, it's really my pleasure to be here with you this evening to share some poetry and things like that. I want to respect your time. I know you guys are running a bit late, so I'm going to just get into it and let the poetry talk. All right, we time. It's funny, too, because, you know, when I tell people what I do for a living, they often respond by saying things like, bless your soul, that must be difficult. And my all-time favorite, it's so nice to see someone not working for the money. I bet you know that one, right? I'm a social worker. I tend to the wounds of people crucified to circumstance. I carry hope and band-aids in my briefcase, share my own scars for street cred. I work with kids who are far more familiar with pain than promise. Each one has a story. A refugee boy from the Congo jokes about coming from a village of magicians, but they don't perform tricks or illusions. They slowly disappear in front of the whole world's eyes from malnutrition. They count rib bones through skin as though they are the days left in their lives. He, like so many others, mines coltan for less than 30 cents a day. Coltan is a mineral used in the production of our smartphones, but I never hear stomachs growling in the clarity of my reception. He is a survivor. A Kiche girl from Guatemala keeps a museum of sweatshop scars in her hands. Indigenous tongue tucked into the drawer of her heart, she describes her journey to me in Spanish. Describes traveling across two countries as human cargo atop a freight train, watching as the hungry iron beast swallowed migrant lives along the way. She saw the United States in the sunrise every morning, a metaphor for a brighter tomorrow. Today, she wears her hair long again, braiding it with the sunshine in her smile, she is a survivor. A boy from Afghanistan wants to be a pediatrician. He has seen far too many bloody bodies broken beyond repair in his homeland. War turned him into an orphan. War turned his parents into tombstones, but his heart, his heart is still beating. Compassion still running through his veins. He wants to replace the bombs of his youth by placing balloons in children's hands. He is a survivor. A 17-year-old Karin girl from Myanmar remembers rice patties, banana trees, and barbed wire. Refugee camp confinement still fresh on the breath of her story. She can still hear the marching of soldiers' boots in her dreams. The screams of her people as life left their bodies through the bullet holes hollowing their chests. She finds peace in her God. Her hands welded into prayer position. Her faith, her only lifeline, PTSD, is peppered in her new beginning. But through all of this, she tastes freedom for the first time. She is a survivor. There are thousands upon thousands of these stories bound in the book that is America. Survivors seeking second chances and better tomorrows. This nation has never been a melting pot. Rather, it's always been a wishing well of opportunity. We are all coins depositing ourselves in the ideals of humanity. Let's wear brotherhood like a badge of honor. Lend a hand to pull others from their plight so they can stand on their own. And when they do, we will march together into a better tomorrow. Our love for one another outweighing our fear. We will see the 
forest through the trees by clearing the leaves that have blinded our eyes for far too long, it is there. The land of opportunity will be more than a catchphrase. It is there that we will truly learn what it really means to be human. Thank you. So as a, as a performance writer and an and activist, I get to do all kinds of cool work. I get to travel all over the country performing poems and working with youth. Um, I just did a residency on the Yaki Reservation down in Arizona, which was really, really neat. Um, and I work with kids a lot in teaching them poetry and the tool of poetry as, as a way to express themselves, especially in regard to cultural identity. Uh, one time I was conducting a, a workshop with a group of, of young girls in middle school. And uh, usually, you know, they're a very, very quiet group. They're not really uh, outspoken and things like that. But when we were brainstorming ideas for poems, uh, one girl hopped up right away. She raised her hand right away. And for me, I was like completely, you know, happy by that because usually the kids are texting or doing something else, right? Um, so I was like, yes, yes, what would you, what, what? You know, I was super surprised. And she said, I want to write a poem about the way people look at my grandmother because she only speaks Spanish. We go to the store, they roll their eyes at her because she uses me to translate, and I want to write a poem about that. And I was like, wow, okay. Uh, so there's this huge subject that she wanted to tackle, right? And we had this six-week um, poetry workshop every Saturday. I left that night, like, scratching my head, like, oh my goodness. I actually went home and used her, her story as a prompt, and I wrote her a poem. And I told her the next week that we met, I said, if anybody ever tells your grandmother anything or rolls their eyes at her again, you tell them that my existence does not rely on one language to tell its story. Off my tongue, two cultures dance merengue for the right to be heard. In a world that is black and white, sometimes brown is the color of the sore thumb. See, I remember listening to mis abuelitos, code switching like computer passwords between idioms, ingles, when talking to us, espanol, when talking about us, my ears were trained to the tune of two languages. Songs of survival sing for my grandmother's accents. Wisdom passed down in los dichos de mi abuelito. We have been taught to serve as the hyphen between two lands, our roots. We hold on to in the palms of our hands as assimilation attempts to shake one. Our influence, like our presence, is evident. Our culture, like our people, have crossed over. And our language, like good memories, is here to stay. In a nation that preaches multiculturalism, but teaches it monolingually, we are linguistically well endowed. Ambidextrous tongue slinging Spanglish leaves sectors of society skeptical. It's going like sirens ring out from our syllables as we're speaking bilingual sentences. I, like Jehovah's, have witnessed people rolling their eyes at the sound of us rolling our R's as they ask the age-old question, can you speak English? Now, realizing that the use of their word can connotatively asks the question, do you have the ability, we reply, yes, we can. Pero a veces preferimos hablar en español. <laughs> they continue, eating their enchiladas, which they ordered in English, because, well, to order Mexican food in Spanish would just be weird, right? <laughs> we Latinos have learned that Spanish is not America's favorite subject. Mathematics is. And they're attempting to use it against us. See, lately it appears that America wishes to divide our multiplication by adding a wall along the border in hope of subtracting our numbers because we are now looked at as the square root of America's problem where Maria squared plus Jose squared equals America scared. <laughs> we have replaced terrorism in the scope of America's gun. Aim has shifted from one brown people to another, from Kufis, Korans, and praying to the east to illegal aliens and wetbacks poisoning the southwest, but we don't need bullets bearing the face of hate shot at our feet to dance. We will do it anyway. We don't need their permission to speak because we will do it anyway. So I asked mi abuelita, tell me a story in the spirit of the past so that it does not die. She replies, mijo, it will only perish if you choose to murder it. So I speak of the past in present terms so 
so my people will understand me. Rotating between hip hop slang in English and Galo in Spanish. Our existence is far too complex to place us in any boxes. We still refuse to check the ones that say other on our applications. We are burning in the melting pots. Mi poesía es mi grito, an SOS written in the sands of two languages because my existence does not rely on one language to tell its story. Thank you. <laughs>